Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Hans. I'm going to be filling in for Dr. Paul Duchesne this week. Um, happy to see you guys, <laughs> virtually at least. Um, I'm going to walk us through a section of a chapter of Mark that I've been studying and reading recently and just kind of wanted to share a few moments with you guys. So we're going to be looking at Mark 1, 14 through 34. Uh, but first, uh, let me go ahead and open us kind of in a, in a word of prayer um, to, to, to get us started here. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, God, for the privilege to discuss your word freely in a free country, God. And I just praise and thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, God. And just uh, give us peace and help us to understand uh, your word as we study it tonight, God. We love you, we cherish you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first I want to kind of bring us into some context about uh, this particular section of Mark. Of course, it's the first chapter, so we, but there's still some context that I want to bring us into. So verses 1 through 8 talks about how John the Baptist is preparing the way uh, for Jesus. Verses 9 through 11 is the baptism of Jesus, and then verses 12 through 13 is the temptation of Jesus. And that's where we're going to be picking up at is in verses 14 through 20. Marks 1, 14 through 15 will be the first section that we look at here. And we're going to read, and it says, Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Here we see Jesus' authoritative call in verses 14 through 20. Uh, verses 14 through 15 specifically, I think we see kind of a twofold call to his authoritative call here. We see in verses 14 through 15 a call to salvation. And we see that it is a call of repentance to God. And um, why do we have to repent to God? Well, we have to repent to God because we've transgressed his laws. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We also see a call of faith in the gospel in verse 15. What is the gospel? Well, for the people listening during this time, they're probably thinking political kind of unrest and uprising. But Jesus was looking forward towards the cross. And we see that the gospel in this case, I believe, is God's redeeming work through his son Jesus. It's the, what he came to do. And he was beginning that ministry here. So the first question is, have we repented and accepted Christ? Because that's the foundation for everything. If we lack that, the rest of the cause, the rest of the Bible doesn't make any sense. We need to accept him as our Lord and Savior. And, that, and that's the first challenge I ask you. You kind of consider to yourself, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you accepted that first call to salvation? Verses 16 through 20, we see Jesus calling his first disciples. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in a boat, mending their nets. Mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. See, in verses 16 through 20 that we just read, we see a call. Again, I think we see two kind of calls. We see a call to follow first, and then we see a call to multiplication secondary. The call to follow, what does it mean to follow? It means to have that relationship. And Jesus was calling these first four disciples into a relationship with him to learn from him, to study from him. And, and it's it's really, really important that we see, uh, I, think, I like the translation of the New American Standard where it says, they will uh, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Just because you are a follower of Christ doesn't mean that you know how to disciple others. And that's why that call to discipleship and following and a, a mentor Christian is so, is so key. We see that this relationship is about actively engaged in learning. And we see that kind of the modern day church in, in, in discipleship groups. In 
our BFTs, where we are actively learning together from other Christians' life and experiences, but more so specifically into a discipleship group where you're working on one-on-one, one-on-three with, with several men uh, or, or the same gender or whoever you may be. And you are living life with them, learning from them, learning from their past experiences, and, and studying God's Word, being key in that. The second part we see is a call to multiplication. And what does it mean to become fishers of men? Again, it kind of is key to relationship. We have that relationship with our Father through salvation. We have been through the Son through salvation, but we also have a, have a calling and a relationship that we have amongst our own brothers and sisters of Christ, but even beyond that, to those outside of the faith that, that we are sent to minister to, that we are sent to guide, sent to teach. And that's about actively engaging others and sharing God's redeeming work in Jesus that, that we ourselves have experienced. And, and I can think of no greater verses than Matthew 28, 18 through 20 that, that covers that. And that's in Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's talking to the disciples. And, uh, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see a need, a call to become fishers of men is a call of obedience to the Great Commission. It's not merely, it's not good enough just to come to church just to be here. It's about being in relationship with Christ and actively participating in his ministry and his work and in spreading his good news. So are we followers of Christ and spreading the gospel in obedience or are we kind of rebellious in that area? Then, if we continue on through this Mark 1 passage, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 22. And they read, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, meaning Jesus, went and entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I've seen it written in multiple different commentaries and different books that I've read that it has been said that the scribes spoke from authorities, but that Jesus spoke with authority. And why is that? And that's because Jesus is the Word. We see that in John 1, uh, John 1, 1 through 3 and 14 through 15. And John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. John 1, 14 through 15, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So his authority came from the fact that he is the Word. He, 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 is, he is the Word. Jesus also valued prayer and dedicated time with his Father. It's also to that authoritative teaching as well, because he, he constantly withdrew and communicated with his Father. You see that through numerous passages in the Gospels. I just kind of pulled out three separate ones. Matthew 14, 23. After he had sent the crowds away, this after feeding the 5,000, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray when it was evening, and he was there alone. Another one is Mark 135, which is just at the end of what we're reading, and also 646. 135 reads, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. And then Mark 646, After bidding them farewell, he left the mountain to pray. And then I'm going to end us with Luke 612, as far as the places where we see Jesus going off to pray. It was at, it was at this time that he went off the, to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. <clears throat> so 
So we see that he stayed in constant communion with the Father through prayer and through dedicated time. And that's key for us as Christians in our life as well. Without that, that verb relationship being strong in our life, or as our relationships are not going to be what they should be. We're not going to be doing anything be able to do the work that God which has for us, has instilled for us to do. So are we in that regular communication? Are we in, in are we in the regular communication with our Heavenly Father? We have that dedicated time where we're focused on prayer, on studying His Word, on studying His lessons, um, personally by ourselves, as well as as well as with the with a discipleship group, as well as in our BFT, as well as in our sanctuary, as we're, as we're hearing the messages. Do we have that dedicated time that we do daily with, with him to, to learn about him, to build that relationship? Because to follow him means we have to have that relationship with him. And to have that relationship means you have to spend time with him. If we don't spend time with him in his word and in prayer, then we can't have no relationship. It becomes empty. Then the third point I wanted to kind of share with us, with you guys tonight, is Jesus' authoritative power. That's going to be in verses 23 through 34. It's a longer passage than the other ones, but I'm going to read it all intact at one point, and then we're going to kind of dissect it in smaller pieces. So just then there was a man in the synagogue with an, in, with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey. Immediately the news about him spread into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came and the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and all those who were being demon possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and healed many who were ill with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak, because they knew who he was. So, in verses 23 through 28 and 34, we see Jesus' authoritative power over the demons. And note that that, that, note that, that fear is there, especially in Mark 1, 25. You come to destroy us? They knew who Jesus was, and knew his powers, his authority. Note also that their powerlessness in front of Christ, which is in verses 25 through 26. Jesus sent it out of the man. Jesus, pre, Jesus prevented it from speaking further. And Jesus prevented it from harming the man further at that point of time, at that point of exit. And we see that in the sister account of this, to this scenario in Luke, Luke uh, 4, 33, Thirty-five. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come out to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. It's, uh, it's, it's truly um, powerful, um, especially when we have so many accounts and the same stories in multiple cases of there. We see different people's perspectives on it. And, and we see that we get this additional wealth of information about the demon coming out of this man and man remaining unharmed, um, which is truly, um, truly amazing about you. This is awesome power. We also see his authoritative power over sickness, verses 29 through 31 and 34. We see the healing of Peter's mother-in-law in verse 31. He came out and he came to her, Jesus came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. Now this 
has always been a pretty cool story in my mind uh, because when I was young, I had lots of fevers. And after a fever, I was tired and exhausted. I didn't want to get up and wait on anybody. But Jesus' power over the sickness healed this healed Peter's mother-in-law so completely that she was able to immediately get up and, and, and serve him. She didn't wait to be waited on or expect people to come to her. He, she served him. We also see the healing of others who are um, demon-possessed in verse 34. And he healed many who were ill of various diseases and cast out many demons. He was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. It wasn't time for yet for him to reveal to the world who he was. So my question Final question, I guess, is do we live a transformed life? We see Jesus' authoritative power in, in his calling and in his, and in his um, teaching and, in, and over sickness and over demons. And we see what he did on the cross for us. How he died to take the place of me, of us, of our sins. Do we live a transformed life after that acceptance? Are we like Peter's mother-in-law who gets up and serves him? Or are we still kind of waiting to be served? To live a transformed life means so much more than just simply sticking to a religious set of guidelines and rules, going to church on Sunday, doing this. All those things are great things, but if that's what your that's what your life is about, that's your only piece of your spiritual life, that you're missing so much more if you're truly saved. You're missing so much more the deeper relationship you can have with Christ, the deeper relationship you can have with others, and the impact that that God can have through you being his hands and feet. So I challenge us all that we live transformed lives based on his calling, based on his power, based on who he was and what he did for us. May we serve him and be transformed from in that, inside out. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, it's been a bit of pleasure. A little nervous and nerve-wracking from a camera. I think I'd feel more comfortable if there was lots of people out there more so than in front of a camera, but I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. And I want to close out in prayer. I hope that you guys have a wonderful Wednesday evening. Thank you God again so much for allowing us to meet, to study your word, and to to learn from you, Lord, to learn how amazing and awesome you are. Thank you, God, so much again for what you did on the cross for us. Lord, and may you encourage and strengthen and convict us all to dive deeper in our relationship with you, Lord. Let it not just be a one-time item of it or something we just do on Sundays, Lord. But may we crack open the Bible every day. May we study your word. May we pour into the depths of prayers of you, God. May we rise to that call of discipleship to disciple others who are new to the faith, Lord, and to be discipled by, by those who, who have gone before us, Lord. May we, may we work together in this life toward your goals, Lord. And in all things, you have the honor and the glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.